Okay. Okay, so welcome to, to this evening's Bible study, the book of Acts. We are now going to start uh, chapter 8 today. Last time we had, uh, last where we stopped was chapter 7. So for those who are going to join us for the first time, welcome. You can also catch those videos of the past sessions in our YouTube channel, The Berean Project. And uh, as I mentioned, just by way of um, summary, we view the book of Acts as not just a study of the early church. So it's some tend to look at it as just descriptive of early church history. We really look at this as doctrines in action. That's how I would probably title this, this, um, this Bible study. Because today, nowadays, the church has been alienated. I like to say it's been alienated from the book of Acts, because what the way we do church today is so different from the early church. And not only the way we do church, but also a lot of foundational doctrines have been lost. And I like to use baptism as, as an example. And, uh, what, and what I mean by that is when you look at the early church, when people came to faith, they got baptized immediately. That was the biblical response to the gospel. And tonight... We're going to spend more time on that because we're going to be talking about Philip, the deacon, and how he will baptize uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. Okay, so we will touch on that. And along the way, I'm going to show you how these doctrines were the original intention. But after 2,000 years, things have really changed. So let's just jump into chapter 8 of the book of Acts. In chapter 7, we recall that Stephen was martyred. He was executed. He was, uh, he was on a face-off with the Sanhedrin, the council, uh, the, the Jewish council. And after showing to them that you guys have been you know, effectively stubborn, you have rejected God's plan, purpose, it's a hit and miss. And they said, starting with Abraham all the way to, to David and... When he came to Jesus, basically he said, you missed the Messiah, you murdered him. And before he could finish his presentation, which I think would have ended in the second coming, he, they stoned him. And they stoned him in front of a man named Saul. And this man named Saul, we know would become one of the most important people in the New Testament. He would become Paul, the apostle. And he wrote almost quite a big, he, he and Luke actually wrote most of the New Testament. I'm not sure exactly how much percent, but definitely uh, a lot of the New Testament. And he's still called Saul here before his conversion on the road to Damascus. So let's jump in and I'm going to read chapter 8. And I'm going to share my screen. Okay, let's, let's read on. So Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. So they, lay, they laid their cloak before Saul. And by doing that, it was a way of um, getting his approval. He, didn't, he could have stopped it, but perhaps being the most senior Pharisee there, he just, uh, he just kept silent. And he would regret later on his, in his writings, calling himself the worst of sinners. Perhaps he had this in mind where he allowed the execution of Stephen, who was not only the first martyr, he was quite a young man, probably in his teens. Some say 17, 18, 19, so very young uh, person and he had supernatural knowledge of the scripture that he was able to face off the Sanhedrin before they decided to stone him so they just couldn't stand him but definitely uh, the knowledge he had was was uh, was quite supernatural because there are many things in the book of acts chapter 7 that, that are not even in genesis like um, abraham delaying his obedience to the to to god when he said uh, move up to the, the promised land but he according to stephen he delayed he stayed he went upstream um with his father and only when his father passed away then did he move to the promised land so that was about 25 years talk about disobedience uh, so it, god doesn't really highlight that anymore in genesis although stephen touches and touches on that and we also learned about moses things that were not in Exodus, how he was trained in all the knowledge of the Egyptians. 
Uh, Moses was just not some or- ordinary guy. He was a prince of Egypt and possibly even being groomed to be the uh, next in line to, to the throne. Pharaoh is a title, not the name of the king. So he could have been a future Pharaoh. We also learned in last meeting, uh, the last meeting, how he was exiled in the land of uh, Midian. And we know that Mount Sinai is in Midian, not in Egypt. It's really in Saudi Arabia today, Mount Jabal al Los. And I showed you using Google Map, when you look at the passage in Galatians 4, where it talks about Hagar, who represents uh, Sinai, looks is the bondwoman, and how uh, Sinai looks up or is, uh, corresponds to Jerusalem. The Greek word there is a navigational term, meaning to say in the same row or column, in the same par- parallel. So when you look at Google Map, you can see Mount Jabal Allah's Western Saudi Arabia by the Gulf of Aqaba goes straight up into Jerusalem. So it's both literal and uh, figurative. So I just mentioned that for those who, were, who missed uh, our, our Bible studies last meeting. Okay, let me jump, jump, let me jump in again to, um, to chapter uh, 8, verse 1. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death, and on that day a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Apostles. So from chapter 8 onwards, you're going to see how the focus is no longer Jerusalem. It's going to be now Samaria. And then it goes from Judea to Samaria. And then they go further out. You'll see Paul's journeys, missionary journeys, extend to Asia Minor, uh, eventually to Greece, uh, to Rome. So it's, it's widening, and uh, we're going to see why. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. So uh, He was the first martyr. But Saul began ravaging the church. So the, the persecution begins actually here at this point with the death of Stephen. This is the Jewish persecution. The Roman persecution would take place much later on. So they, and, and this Saul, Paul, would lead this persecution. So, but Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. So, if you remember, uh, Jesus was telling them, you'll be my witnesses in In Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, until the utmost parts of the world. And a world, right? And he's telling them, take the gospel, preach the gospel, and take it to the nations. And what we learned from church history is that they actually, the early church, didn't really obey uh, the commands of Jesus. They stayed put in Jerusalem, and it took this Jewish persecution to really drive them out. So I wonder if they had listened to Jesus and began taking it out. Uh, would they have experienced this? Well, for all you know, this is part of God's plan. But surely it was this persecution that began to drive them out of Jerusalem and push them into the outer regions, Judea, and then eventually Samaria. Well, Philip, so this is the deacon Philip. He's one of those uh, that were commissioned back in, uh, was it Acts 5? among the deacons, and later on, he become, uh, in Acts 20, he would become the evangelist. But he's a deacon here. He went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. By the way, um, when you say went down to the city of Samaria, uh, we know that Samaria is north of Jerusalem, right? So why is it, does anyone know why it just says he uh, went down? Any idea? Okay, because... No, 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 not yet. <laughs> Um, Jerusalem, that whole region is on a higher level, the higher elevation. So they literally went down, but down north towards Samaria. Because, yeah, so if, uh, Samaria was known to be uh, the, the area of the northern kingdom, which was overrun by Assyria in 70, 722 BC. And uh, the Israelis, the Judeans, looked down on them as being half, something like half Jews, because they intermarried <coughs> with the people around. Uh, the Assyrian Empire. So what happened that that time is in uh, Assyria, when they conquered northern um, Israel, that's the uh, led by Ephraim, 
they took they took them all out and transplanted them all over the Assyrian Assyrian Empire. Then they got people from the Assyrian kingdoms and transplanted them into northern Israel, the region of Samaria and, and, and that whole area. And many believe that um, when you get to Ezra, they're being chastised for that even the priests were marrying you know the people of Samaria. There are there is reason to believe that there are bloodlines of the Genesis Nephilim already mixed into that, but it's another discussion. We won't, talk, we won't talk about that today. Let's move on. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. What signs is this? For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So what's the signs? Philip is casting out demons, casting out spirits. And people would scream when, when they experience deliverance. And we have experienced that many times. And we continue to see that. Uh, not all the time, but very uh, quite frequently people would uh, scream as the demons would come out. And... And I like to always make the connection between deliverance and healing. It says here, those who had been paralyzed or who had infirmities, they were healed. So, you know, very much in this study, if you've been following this by now, that there's a relationship between deliverance or casting out demons and healing. Very often when uh, demons leave, people get healed. And what's why? It's because the demons are causing that. Not always there are demons involved, but when there are demons involved, uh, very often, there is some form of infirmity or sickness involved too. So when they are casted out, we see people get healed. We see tumors uh, instantly uh, dissolve and, and shrink after demons leave. So it makes you wonder now, where did the life of the tumor come from? It came from the demons. So there was much rejoicing in the city. So it must have been an amazing uh, sight to behold where people are getting set free getting healed, so there's much rejoicing. And remember in Luke, or is it Matthew, uh, there's a verse that said that kings and prophets look forward to see these things, and they did not. And here we are, we're privileged. They were privileged in the time of Jesus, and so we are today, those who are practicing this. We are seeing all these things that even the prophets and kings look forward to seeing. Now, so uh, what's interesting about Philip is that he really is... A man without a title, without a position. Uh, I like to mention in our previous meetings that uh, in the early church, no one really cared, carried titles. No one had, they didn't have hierarchical positions. They did have elders, plural. But the idea of calling people by a title and having some kind of hierarchy that, that was not present in the book of Acts, in the early church. And for those who say that these miracles were only something that were done by apostles uh, we can see philip was not not an apostle he was uh, possibly a new believer a, a deacon but definitely stephen was also working miracles and he was a teenager without any um he was just a deacon a teenager so uh, this book of acts is not just about apostles doing uh, amazing signs and wonders it's really about the holy spirit regardless of whether they were like the apostles, because we know Stephen and Philip, uh, they were not apostles, right? And uh, to begin with, the apostles who were doing these things were just, uh, that were uh, documented doing this were John, and uh, together with Peter, Paul, and the rest were not apostles, okay? So why, why am I saying this? Because a lot of people think that, okay, so it's book of Acts is not for, day, for, for today, and if it were today, those miracles are only for you know, the, the apostles. So it's not true. These uh, healing miracles and casting of demons can be done with anyone by faith. So let's just move on. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, this man is what is called the great power of... Did I skip? I think I skipped. Now, there was a man, back to verse 9, there was a man named Simon who was formerly was practicing magic in the city. And astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. So don't think of magic as just um, magic like today's magician. These, yeah, these were sorcery. This was this was the powers of the occult, uh, not just slate or illusion like what we see. Think in terms of uh, 
mag magicians today. This is the occult, sorcery and uh, dark arts. Yeah. And they all from the smallest to the greatest were giving attention to him saying this man is what is called the great power of God. So there's a deception going on and Simon has deceived people th into thinking that he is the great power of God. Right? So, uh, and they were giving him attention because, here we go, because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. So this is the occult. These are sorceries and witchcrafts. And they really did have power, but this was a demonic form of power. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. So they were believing and they were, so Philip was preaching the good news, the gospel, and they believed the gospel. And what happened? They were baptized. They were baptized. So immediately, this is what's happening. Today, we don't see that. Um, if ever they do, they do it some kind of uh, symbolical ritual or to, to um, declare publicly. But it's more than that. And we mentioned that baptism is a burial, a washing of sins and a burial of the old, the old self. And I'll review that in a moment. Even Simon himself. So this is interesting because, okay, Simon himself believed. And he got baptized. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. So he believed. Makes you wonder, what did he believe? And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. Right. So I don't know what to make of this, but it definitely says what it says. He believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. However, it's okay, let's, let's let's just read on. He got baptized. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So the people there believed, they got baptized, and now the apostles are going there. To make sure that they receive the Holy Spirit. You see, it's a separate event. Uh, nowadays, people just assume that when they come to faith in Christ, they receive the Holy Spirit. Or if they get baptized, uh, it's automatic they receive the Holy Spirit. It's not necessarily the case. It does happen that when people do get baptized, sometimes the Holy Spirit comes. And because of faith, they receive Him. They are expecting it. But in this case, they had to come down, the apostles, and make sure they receive the Holy Spirit. It says here, for he, he, the Holy Spirit, had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So what happened? They got baptized in water, but they have not yet been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the apostles are going down to make sure that they receive the Holy Spirit. So I'm using the word receiving the Holy Spirit and baptized in the Holy Spirit interchangeably. So... Next verse, then they began laying their hands on them. So this is the practice of how the, the, the Holy Spirit uh, comes on people. They laid their hands on them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. So laying of hands was the practice for receiving the Holy Spirit. Um, the person receives the Holy Spirit by faith and the person who is laying his hands is also doing by faith. So it's all by faith. Okay, so if there's no faith, it's not going to happen. I've seen people where we lay their hands and they don't receive the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, perhaps they didn't have faith to receive him. It is, And there are many who today who have been baptized in water, but have not yet been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, they believe Jesus, they've repented, they, they got baptized in water, but they have not yet received or been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I'll talk about that in a while. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying, of the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Okay, so they call this simony when you try to buy some kind of spiritual uh, power or favor. Uh, he thought that it could be, he, 
what he was trying to buy the power to give the holy spirit that's what that's that's what he, oh here it is he saying saying give this authority to authority to me as well so that every everyone on whom i lay my hands may receive the holy spirit so he was he wanted to buy this power this authority you know, which is by faith okay it's you, you can't buy it it's by faith you lay your hands by faith and the person receives it by faith so he had this wrong understanding and it gets worse because peter said to him may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of god with money so this is a very strong rebuke from peter may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of god with money you have no part or portion in this matter for your heart is not right before god therefore repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the lord, pray the lord that if possible the intention of your heart may be forgiven you for i see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity and this is after he got baptized it's interesting that this is all being said but simon answered and said pray to the lord for me yourselves he's, he's saying you do it you pray for me so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. And it, that story ends. And, you know, that story ends and it doesn't say that he repented. He just says, you be the one to pray for me. Right? Uh, there's no sign that he repented. Which really leads us to conclude that he never really came to faith. He got baptized. He believed, but it's possible he believed jesus in the sense that he believed who he that he was possibly the son of god and uh, and and that he had powers and he was existing and all that but believing in the sense of entrusting himself to him to the point of surrendering and following him and giving up his i think that was missing so many people today they say they believe jesus yes i believe jesus but they don't follow him i've met many people who say yeah, I believe Jesus, but they've never repented or they don't follow him. So it's actually uh, a sign that they did not really believe. And even more disturbing, he got baptized. I think there are a lot of, and we ourselves, to be honest, I have in the past uh, baptized people that I realized shouldn't have after, I realized after should not have been baptized. And now I'm more careful when I baptize, I really go through I talk to them, try to better understand them, and also uh, uh, wait on the Spirit to give me some discernment. Because some people in the past, they wanted to get baptized only to find out their intentions were, they had different intentions. You know, like uh, uh, one, just because they wanted to join the local church. And after they came in, um, it turns out they didn't believe in the doctrine of baptism. They didn't believe in, the, in, in what they did. They would question it and realize that they would worse manifest demons. That, that uh, they, they were not free of the demons that we were trying to uh, cast them out. And I, I felt that the Holy Spirit was warning me that these are the kinds of people who were trying to infiltrate the local church. And that's why I think the laying of hands was an important feature of the early church uh, when they... Uh, when they got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of water, it was like uh, their, their way of knowing that they already part of the church. Today, it's a bit easier. You go through seminars and you go through ritual baptism. And, you know, uh, without any supernatural confirmation, um, anyone could just enter the church. And we have seen these people filled with demons. I mean, screaming at us and, 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 and scary stuff. And they were wanting to get in, baptize them, after thinking that they were, uh, you know, sincere. It turns out they were uh, against our preaching of the baptism. And that explained why they were not free from uh, the demonic spirits, you know, talking spirits even. So um, not that many, maybe several at least. And another one wanted, just wanted to get close to us and really begin to fellowship, but didn't really uh, surrender and give up idolatry. 
So these were, I would call, invalid baptisms that took place. So I'm not surprised the case of Simon, it, it happened. Uh, that's why, guys, when we baptize people, we really need to be sure that uh, we need to check if they really understand the gospel, if they are repenting and believing in Jesus and his finished work. A lot of people say they believe Jesus, but they, what they really do is they believe he existed, he walked on the earth, but not enough to totally trust him and give up their lives and follow him. So they just believe that he is a great figure, but not enough to trust him with their lives. And uh, that's where the difference lies. Because if you really trust him, you trust his words, you will follow him. And we have shown that believing and obeying are really one in the New Testament. You can't separate that. To separate it is to suggest hypocrisy that you can believe Jesus who he is, but not believe what he says, because that would be hypocrisy. Okay, before we move on to um, verse 25, because that story ends there. Well, let me just finish this before Philip is uh, uh, brought to another area. Let me just, one more verse. So when they had solemnly, solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started to go back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages of Samaritan. So the gospel is now being spread to Samaria. And uh, I'm going to show you that um, let's see here. I want to show you how the origins of the Great Commission. Let's look at it. When Jesus sent them out. Okay. the uh, or I'm looking for. Oh, here it is. Sorry about that. Hold on. Do you see what I'm. Yeah. Okay. You know, when Jesus began his three your mission he began in Luke 4 18 you know with healing the sick casting out demons he, and preaching the gospel he read from the scrolls of Luke 4 18 which was quoting Isaiah 51 that the spirit of the Lord is upon me etc etc right and his mission was was marked by healing casting casting demons and preaching the gospel he was basically setting people free so they would be free to follow him because we know in uh, that the Son of Man was revealed to destroy the works of the devil. That's what he. That's what he. It was revealed so that he could uh, expose and destroy the works of the devil. And his the the uh, the apostles, the original twelve, were also sent out within Judea. So Judea first, and they were commanded in Matthew ten to do the same thing: to heal the sick, cast out demons, and they did it. 12 of them. And later on in Luke 10, 70 others, 70 other disciples were uh, commanded to go to Ju Judea at this time to go even as far as Samaria. So like Jesus training them to go out. And they did the same thing as the 12 and they did the same thing as Jesus did. They healed the sick, they cast out demons and they were preaching the gospel. So that's Luke 10. So this is actually the origins of the Great Commission. When we get to the Great Commission, he is now sending out all his disciples. He says, you will be my witnesses to Samaria, to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and beyond to the ends of the earth. So he's now involving more people. And the scope of that mission now is beginning to expand. And we know about Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20, where he says, you know, go and make disciples of all nations, Right. Uh, but the other Great Commission ver verse is Mark 16, verses 15 to 20, where he says, you know, um, um, go preach the gospel to all creation. He talks about healing and casting out demons would be the signs that would be accompanied them. So uh, all of these that, you know, th this Mark 16 verse, the other Great Commission is not so much talked about in church today because we don't see this. So they just love Matthew 28. We'll talk about that, but they don't talk about Mark 16. We know in Acts 1 8, he said that you will be clothed in power. So, <clears throat> what Jesus is doing is that he's training a few, he's training more, and finally he says, All of you, I'm going to go now, I'm going to sit at the right hand of the Father, but don't worry, I'm going to send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. He will clothe you in power, and you're going to what? You're going to continue my mission. So what I'm showing you here is that the Great Commission is actually a continuation of Jesus' mission in Luke 418. And I want to show you the, the Luke 418. Luke 418 is actually just a reading of Isaiah. He, he read the scrolls 
in Isaiah 61. And he says, the, the spirit, spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to, to what? To preach the good news or the gospel to the poor. When you say poor, not li literally poor, but those who are poor in spirit, those who are you know, seeking. He has sent me to heal. Take notes of those words that I've highlighted. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to pro proclaim liberty or freedom to the captives. This is setting them free to proclaim liberty to the captives. We're the captives. We were the captives. And recovery of the sight to the blind. This is healing. So before that, it's setting them free. To set free those who are oppressed. It's deliverance. So you see deliverance or casting demons. You see uh, healing. So to set, them liber to set them free or to proclaim liberty to the captives, that corresponds to set free those who are oppressed. When you get to the other famous, to the other Great Commission verse, the lesser famous Great Commission verse, and look at the highlight. He said to them, go into all the world and what? Preach the gospel. Same thing, to all creation. And these signs, I skipped uh, 16. In 16 says, those who, believe, those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Those who don't believe remain condemned. Okay, so it's also the same command as Matthew 28, baptize them. These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons. That's deliverance, casting out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. They're just supernatural protection. If they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay, lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So you see healing, you see deliverance, you see the preaching of the gospel. So do you see now the origins of the Great Commission? It goes back to Luke 4, 18. And Luke 4, 18 is just a fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah 61. And Jesus read that in the synagogue. And when he read that, they tried to stone him. They tried to kill him, push him off the cliff because he was saying that he was the Messiah of Isaiah 61. So I'm, I'm kind of showing here that the Great Commission is not something new. Uh, it was something... It is actually the continuation of Jesus' ministry. That's what it's about. The ministry that would, was prophesied in Isaiah 61. Okay, and now <clears throat> as we go forward, I, I have mentioned in the past uh, few meetings how today when people come to faith, they repent and that's what they're teaching and that's very good. They also believe in Jesus Christ. But what I see that's missing very often is baptism in water and baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is the biblical response to the gospel. And we know, let me show you. So I think I can, you can, can you see that? Yeah, okay. Repent, believe, baptize. This is the response. Today we just probably see repent and believe. Repent is to change of mind, change from what? From doing sin and following the flesh. Uh, believing is to follow Christ. We, we have mentioned many times that to believe is to obey. Faith without works or obedience is dead. So what, what might have happened with Simon here is that he just believed about Jesus, that he existed, he's a powerful man, possibly even the son of God, but didn't have the faith to obey him and follow him. Just a faith that, yeah, he exists, he is powerful, he's possibly God but not the kind of faith that would lead him to surrender, obey him. So that, and, and uh, he got baptized, but you know, we know that without repentance and truly believing that baptism is invalid because Peter said that you are still in the bonds of iniquity. Well, baptism is supposed to be a burial and washing. It, it's a burial of the old nature. Why? So that we would no longer be slaves to sin. We learned that in Romans chapter 6, in the first uh, eight verses. Baptism in water deals with the past. It deals with your history because without biblical baptism, you may be believing in Jesus, but the sin is going, and the old nature, the old flesh is going to continue warring and pulling us back so we can't follow Jesus. So many believers are struggling with sin and cannot overcome. Perhaps they didn't get baptized in water. They had the baptism, but it was invalid. They didn't have repentance or maybe didn't understand the cross or they didn't understand baptism. It was uh, just a ceremonial thing for them. They're just obeying the pastor and didn't have faith. Um, and then 
all of them through the laying of hands, they receive the Holy Spirit as we know it's done customarily through the laying of hands. There are some exceptions like in Cornelius' household in um, chapter 9 where they received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit just came upon them and baptized them. They had that faith and he just baptized them. So it, it does happen. We baptize people in water and automatically, you know, Holy Spirit comes and baptizes them also. Not always. Uh, that's more of the exception to the rule. Normally after we baptize in water, we lay our hand and we ask the Holy Spirit to come and then we, we check. Did you receive the Holy Spirit? Because when he came, the one person being baptized with the Holy Spirit would experience it. And those who were watching saw something happen. But nowadays, it's pretty much a figment of the imagination. Yeah, I just assume because my pastor said when I came to faith, I, I got the, the Holy Spirit. And yet they don't, they didn't experience anything. And they'll say, what well, you have to experience something? Well, in the book of Acts, it was real to them. But today it's more, um, not real, but more, I, I was, but you know what I'm saying? Like they just assume that it happened, even though, you know, it's, it didn't seem real. So b- baptism of the Holy Spirit the, um, is the empowerment so that the Holy Spirit would begin to dwell, indwell a, a believer and empower him to live a new life so that he would no longer living for himself but Christ living in that person is to start a new life so it's really for the future so it, it deals with the future baptism in water deals with the past and baptism of the Holy Spirit deals with the new life the new born again life we know that John in the book of John when Philip was uh, sorry uh, Jesus was talking to Nicodemus he said you can't see the kingdom of God unless you're baptized in water and spirit. And I think it relates to this. Baptized to put the old self to death, to put the flesh to death, and, and baptized in the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit empowers us to live the new life. And let me show you more about uh, what I mean. Let's cut this. Uh... Now, some people say, but you know what? Um, the thief on the cross... He was not baptized in water. He was not baptized. So, um, yeah, but because the thief in the cross was before the cross, Jesus had not died yet. The complete biblical response to the gospel after the cross is repent, believe, or actually repent and believe to me are, are, are two sides of the same coin. You repent, you change your mind from following your fleshly desires and doing sin and instead follow Jesus. That's believing. So it takes faith or believing in Jesus to follow him. You may repent and still not believe in Jesus. So the idea is to repent and then not turn this way or that way, but turn towards Jesus and follow him. Because you can repent and not still not believe in Jesus. And get baptized in water and baptized or receive the Holy Spirit. The first time you receive the Holy Spirit, you're baptized. You're like immersed. The word baptism is from the, the word immersed. After that, you get filled by the Holy Spirit. I can I pray for a person. And even non-believers, when I pray for them, they get filled up temporarily. And, uh, and they experience the Holy Spirit. They experience joy and they even fall down. right? But they're not yet baptized on their own faith. So I, I don't know how long that will last. Uh, perhaps when they sin again. But if they, came, if they believed, like what happened, I've seen a lot of, quite a number of people, they have not been baptized in water. They got the Holy Spirit because they believed the gospel. They repented. So before water baptism. So while it should be water, then baptized in the Holy Spirit, there are occasions where they get the Holy Spirit first. The Holy Spirit comes upon them because we pray for them. They believe and they get the Holy Spirit. Then uh, in Cornelius' family, we'll read about that in the next chapter. He said, Paul says, Sorry, Peter says, what's to stop us? They got the Holy Spirit, might as well baptize them. And they got baptized immediately. Now, before the cross, it was just repent to the Father. It was repent, and it's really repentance to the Father. And just believing in Jesus. And we know that Paul said in Acts chapter 19, 4, because when he went to um, Ephesus, he said, have you been baptized already uh, to Jesus? He said, no, we have only been, uh, baptized, uh, had the baptism of John. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance. So that baptism is about repentance to the Father, really. Telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. So the baptism in Jesus is because he has now died on the cross. 
So after the cross, you repent to the Father, you believe in Jesus, you get baptized into Jesus' death. So it's a burial. It's a you're joined to Christ through baptism in water, uh, joined to His death, not through the cross, but through the water, because He did it for us already. So that's what Romans six, and then baptism with the Holy Spirit. So you, you see the Trinity really. It's re, you repent to the Father, you believe and are baptized into Jesus, and we get baptized with the Holy Spirit. So that's the difference between the cross and and the, the baptism with the Holy Spirit is done through the laying of hands. So all throughout the book of Acts, when you see them receive the Holy Spirit, someone would, would lay their hands on them. So that, that was just kind of a review um, showing you that this was the biblical response in the early church. Today, what I see happening is that they teach, at least in the good churches, re repentance, and that's good. And faith in Christ, and that's good. But I see a lack of emphasis in quite a lot of denominations with regard to baptism in water. Often it's just something that would take place much later on and as a public declaration rather than, rather than because that's what Jesus commanded. Right? So some people will get baptized later on, maybe after years. Uh, some get baptized in the Holy Spirit, especially among the Pentecostal circles. But they would not get baptized in water. So very, nowadays, they may get all four after a period of time, a long time. As they learn about it, oh, I want to get baptized in water. Oh, I, I, I want the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But back in the book of Acts, if you will go through all the accounts where they came to faith, all of them got repented, they, got, they came to faith in Christ, and they got baptized in water and received the Holy Spirit all on the same day, except here in this case where Paul uh, goes up to them and asks them, did you get baptized in water? No, we didn't even know. So he baptized them right away in water. Okay, so we're going to move on. Again, I'm reminding you, we are seeing doctrines in actions. Now, as I move on, you might see in some verses that he's talking about believing, in other verses, baptizing, and others, um, uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why not all four? Yeah, because this is one book. You, you can't really take one verse and turn that into doctrine on its own. You got, got to see the whole book of Acts. And all throughout, they will cover all four. Right? Because when you believe, it, it assumes that as you believe, you also turn from your sin, you repented. And, there, and you see baptized, like in, in Peter, he, uh, be, repent and be baptized. Where's the faith? Yeah, because you won't get baptized unless you had faith. It would, it, it would be a silly thing to dip yourself in water unless you had faith. Okay, I will answer the questions after at the end of the... Uh, 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 there's some questions that are coming up already. I'll answer that at the end. Let's proceed. Okay, you know what? Maybe we should answer this because we're going to enter into another topic which in itself is really quite interesting. So let me just... Um, it's now 9 o'clock. Let's... Let's... Um, let me just open the... Uh, okay. There's a question for someone baptized as a child around 9 or, or 10. Will I need to be baptized again? Yes, you... Well, depends. I, um, if you had repented of your sins, okay? If you have repented of your sins, that's the condition we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, repent and be baptized. Because without repentance of sins, a recognition and an acknowledgement that you are a sinner, what's there to, to bury? Baptism is a washing and a burial. What are you going to bury? Without a repentance, there's nothing to bury. So often very children at a young age, they're still innocent or they're not aware of their sin. But the moment they become aware of their sin and they are understand the gospel that Jesus died uh, for their sins and they have that conviction, they're ready for baptism. But if someone doesn't understand sin at that time, then that's an invalid baptism. Surely infant baptism is not biblical. Like what's happening with the Catholic Church, it is not biblical because a baby would not know anything of his sin at, at a very innocent age. So not just asking for, okay. For, so if you haven't been baptized, it is important. Why? Because um, without the baptism, you will find that a person has not buried the old nature. Okay, and we see very often at baptism, people also get delivered uh, from from uh, from the bondage of sin. It says there in Romans six verse six to eight, so you'll no longer be slaves to sin, and you can be free to follow him to to start the new life. 
The purpose of baptism is a burial of the old self, the old nature. So we're no longer slaves to sin. That's why when we baptize, we see a lot of people get delivered. A lot of people who are being delivered, when I hear that they want to get baptized, I say, let's just continue the deliverance with baptism. Since when they get baptized, I find it much easier to, to do a casting of demons because there's no more hold on the part of the demons. They have no more legal ground to, to hold on to the person. The person is now burning the old self because that's what they're holding on, those demons. They're holding on to sin and the old nature. And when a person has decided to die with Christ, they have nothing to hold on anymore. So sometimes when they just uh, take them down the water, it just comes out. Sometimes with shouting, not always. Uh, so and effectively, baptism, what we've seen, is also very powerful deliverance. Okay, so... Uh, let me continue on. Uh, just one question. Is there any questions uh, before I move on? I might as well uh, ask from all of you. Perhaps you may have a question. I'm, so we're doing a review of the doctrines, the biblical response to the gospel. You can, R B B R, where the road meets the rubber. It's easier to remember. Rubber, R B B R. Repent, believe, baptize in water, and then baptize in the Holy Spirit or receive the Holy Spirit. So rubber easy to remember so usually when i talk to people I, I try to find out where are they have you repented okay good do you believe that jesus died on the cross good have you been baptized in water yes they did explain to me your baptism why did you get baptized uh because you know i was in a retreat and everyone got baptized and i was pressured okay that doesn't count. i want to be a member of church because my pastor said and when I hear that, I tell them you didn't get baptized. You had an invalid baptism. You just took a swim. Real baptism is you're repenting, you're calling in the name of Jesus, believing him in effect. And as you go down the water, you are burning the old nature. Without that, it is an invalid baptism. And I've mentioned in the previous meetings, we've met people who thought they were uh, born again or baptized. Uh, uh, they got baptized many years ago. And then when they understood this, they got baptized again, but with the right understanding. And finally, they said, I think only now I've just got born again. And that was quite a surprise. I've got that quite a number of times already because they never experienced real washing and burial and coming of the Holy Spirit upon them. So that's interesting. A lot of it was just uh, intellectual. You know? The pastor said, you're born again because you, did, you said a sinner's prayer. And surely there was faith, but they did not obey Christ's command. Okay, so maybe we can move on. I will... Uh, Continue on to verse 26. Okay, I'm going to continue to verse 26. Verse 26. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. So descends down from Jerusalem, which is a high le elevation, to Gaza. This is a desert road. Uh, this is the region of the Philistines. Um, uh, today, it's no, I think it's the area of the Gaza Strip also. Yeah, this, this is Philistine lands in the past. So he's instructed to go there, by the, led by the Holy Spirit. The okay, next verse. So he got up and went. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. Okay, this is a very, this thing could take hours actually, but I'll try to summarize. He was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading what? The prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation for his life is removed from the earth? 
So he's reading this passage, and we know it's from Isaiah 53, and we will go to Isaiah 53 to read exactly what that was all about. In fact, maybe we should do, do that first. <clears throat> Let's go to Isaiah chapter 53. And so this is a possibly a proselyte, definitely a believer, in, uh, not a Jew, or possibly a Jew. Okay, I, I, For those who mentioned last time about ancient Jews in other lands, there are Jews in Ethiopians. They are called the Falasha Jews. And they're probably these Falasha Jews uh, came back to Israel in the 90s. Um, it's a long story of how the Le Levitical Jews, Levitical priesthood, uh, must have escaped, gone there uh, to Ethiopia uh, back during the days of King Manasseh, the wicked, uh, wicked king who tried to exterminate Judaism. And uh, many scholars believe that during that time, these Levites, uh, knowing the, the, prof the, uh, the prophecies of Moses, that there would be evil kings and also that they'll be overrun and invaded by their enemies, Assyria and Babylon, the time the people who stung and you do not know, uh, they prepared already an uh, emergency plan to escape there during these troubled times. So there are, there are Jews there that might have um, gone there and brought even the ark. That's a possibility. And some have noted that the Jews who are living there, Ethiopian Jews, they practice the oldest form of uh, Judaism. It's called Mosaic Judaism because today's Judaism is nothing like the Bible. It's more for rabbinical Judaism, which is Judaism after the temple got destroyed. It's really more of uh, Talmud and a lot of extra biblical, a lot of it's even Kabbalah. But the original Mosaic Judaism, they found it intact, at least in their practices in Ethiopia. So that was Mosaic Judaism without the trappings of uh, the Talmud and, and rabbinical Juda Judaism, right? Let's look at Isaiah chapter 53. And it says here, he who, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot. Oops. What happened? Is it good now? Okay, let's start again. There, okay. Isaiah 53, I'll start at verse 1 who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. For he is talking about the Messiah and Isaiah. Isaiah was six was written um, um, around 600 BC. So that's maybe 400 years or more before Jesus Christ. For he, and it's a prophecy about the Messiah. For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root. Out of parched ground, he has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. So there's nothing special about his looks. Definitely not a model. Reading verse 2. In verse 3, he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening, the chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his stripes or by his scourging, we are healed. And this is where he's reading. And we pick it up here. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Okay. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and was afflicted. He did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to a slaughter. So this, slaughtered. So this is where the eunuch is reading. And like a sheep that is silent before his shearers. So he did not open his mouth. Okay. So we are reading from uh, the book of Isaiah. And I need to say something about this Ethiopian eunuch. First of all, during those days, uh, Ethiopia uh, uh, was a major kingdom. At one time, it was part of Egypt. And I mentioned that how Moses, according to Josephus, might have annexed uh, Ethiopia. But when we, we get to the times of the kings, 
uh, the Book of Kings. Ethiopia and, 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 and Egypt were like one nation, like pretty much like the United States of today. They were one large uh, empire. And if to the point that they even had uh, King Neko or Pharaoh Neko was an Ethiopian, but he, was at, he had the title of Pharaoh. So they were like joined uh, at one point. And here we have here, um, it's a separate kingdom again, that Queen Candice is sending his eunuch, which is possibly the treasurer because he's bringing some kind of treasure. We don't really know what it is. And the reason why he's called eunuch is it used to be back then that eunuchs were really castrated um, to protect them because they were close to the king and they're in position of power to protect them from being tempted with the harem of the king. But eventually it didn't mean that they were necessarily castrated. So or they might have been, but not anymore. But it did, it just were called eunuchs because earlier in, in ancient times they were really castrated. But uh, in this case, he is a leading official and he's bringing a gift. And I explain where that comes from. And he's on his way to Jerusalem to worship, right? So he obviously he's a believer in the Messiah. He's a possibly a Jew, he, or if not a Jew, at least an Ethiopian or possibly an Ethiopian Jew, working for the the, the kingdom of Ethiopia. And he has heard that the, the Messiah has come already, and he is bringing some kind of gift. And when he gets to Jerusalem, possibly a few days late. He discovers that the so-called Messiah, who is finally the one they're waiting for, has arrived. But instead of seeing someone, you know, if you read the scripture, there are about six times more prophecies about the second coming of Christ than the first coming. And these prophecies of the second coming are like Jesus in an armor with a rod of scepter and conquering king and like David destroying his enemies. You know, they call him the Ben David, the son of David. Many of them didn't know that there is a, first, a prophecy of his first coming. So they were expecting someone like David. So when this Ethiopian believer um, goes to Jerusalem, he heard that the so-called Messiah is not ruling from Jerusalem. Instead, he hung on a cross like a criminal and he's just been buried. So now he's scratching his head and he's going back to, to the scrolls of Isaiah. And he's now possibly reading Isaiah 53 for the first time. Right, and he, and he's reading what we just read, and we're gonna go back to Acts chapter twenty-seven, twenty-eight, chapter eight. Oops, let's go back to Acts. So we'll pick up from what he was reading. So he was expecting someone like possibly like. King David, and instead he sees a crucified Messiah, and he's now scratching his head and he's reading Isaiah 53. And he's saying, Do you understand what you're reading? And Philip gets on board the chariot and he says, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? So Philip rides with him and he's reading from Isaiah 53, what we just read, right? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me. Finally, he's arriving at some. Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of, of himself or of someone else? He's ba basically asking, is Isaiah talking about himself, Isaiah? Or is he talking about someone else? He doesn't get it that this is talking about the Messiah. Many of the Jews rejected Jesus for the same reason. They were fixated on a conquering king, someone coming like David. So him, he didn't even see it. So what does, what does, uh, what does Philip do? Philip opened his mouth and beginning from this scripture, he, oops, share my screen. I'll go back. So here he's saying that eunuch said, please tell me whom does the, the prophet say this? Is it of himself or someone? Is this about Isaiah or is this someone else? He didn't connect it at first, but somehow he's been led to Isaiah 53, 53 after seeing the um, crucified Messiah. And maybe he suspects at this point, but he needs someone to tell him. And Philip opened his mouth and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. So basically saying, yeah, you got the right guy, but he had to die first for our sins to make us his people. 
because someday he will be returning again and, and like as you expected as a conquering king. So much of the, the, the end times prophecies are Jesus coming in victory in a white horse as a conquering king. And that's what a lot of the Jews were expecting. That's why they crucified Christ. They, they rejected him because they were expecting someone like David to overthrow the Roman yoke and uh, take over the world again. Instead, like this eunuch, they see they missed out on the prophecies of his first coming. They didn't understand that he had to die first. As they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Okay. Would you believe these verses I just read to you? If you are using a modern translation of the Bible like NIV, ESV, NLT, some of these translations don't have these verses. They may have a footnote that may say uh, not these were not part of the earlier manuscripts. But in the King James, the NASB, it's there. Okay, I'll explain to you why this is really important. Number one, that's why I have a problem with the modern translations. That I, I, I mean, they're useful, but uh, there, are, there are missing verses, thousands of them, right? And among, the, among them is this one. Uh, if you believe with all your heart, in this case here, it's in parentheses. So check out your, your Bible. If you're using NIV, ESV, it will say some earlier manuscripts don't have this. Um, earlier. What they mean to say is that these modern versions like NIV, ESV, NLT, they use an earlier manuscript from the Alexandrian Codices. Okay, and which is not good because there's the ones who promoted the Alexandrian Codices are scholars, primarily scholars named Westcott and Hort, and you can do research on them. These Greek scholars are actually heretics. If you read more history about them, you fi find out they questioned the resurrection, they questioned a lot of things that we take for granted. Um, they used the Alexandrian Codices because it was an older, older manuscript. But uh, many have pointed out the older manuscript doesn't mean that it is the, re the better manuscript. Because the fact it was Alexandria, Alexandria was quite known as a center for Gnosticism. And I think Irenaeus was one of the early church father Irenaeus has war warned about the Gnostics. Their headquarters was Alexandria. When they found the uh, earlier Codex of Alexandria, it was hardly used. It was basically, you know, it's older, yes, but it was hardly used. The, the other versions, the older, the newer ones that were the basis for King James and NASB, they were really tattered. It tells you something. One was used and one was really unused. But they yet the older manuscripts chose the older, older ones, which were which were not only had missing verses like this, uh, they were being championed by the likes of Westcott and Hort, whose work became the basis for much of the modern translations. That's the NIV, uh, uh, NLT, and, and so on and so forth. So you find that it's either missing or it would say something like it's not present in the older manuscripts. And uh, there's a video I, I could share with you, but uh, that kind of exposes West Kona Hort and how uh, the conclusion is you wouldn't trust these guys with your Sunday school. They denied a lot of things. They were also involved in the secret societies of Hermes during their time in the 18th century. I mean, they were occultists actually. <laughs> so talk about wolves and sheep's clothing. So I just had to mention that. And if you look at verse 36, you know, a lot of people say baptism in water, that's not necessary anymore because what it really means today is that when you believe in Jesus, you get baptized spiritually in Christ. It's a spiritual baptism. I hear that all the time. People, would, especially, you know, in the Western world, uh, you get baptized. There's no such thing as water baptism. It is just that you get baptized spiritually in Christ. That's, that's what Paul, because if you read Paul's letters, you don't see specifically water. He just talks about baptism as a burial because many don't believe Acts anymore. And Acts is the bridge between the Gospels and the epistles. If you take out Acts, there's a missing link. 
not only of the early church, but it links, it explains the doctrines in action. So this is your verse for them and said, no, baptism is in water. It's immersion. It's not just figurative. It's not just um, uh, spiritual. Yes, it is spiritual, but it is also a literal baptism in water. So Acts 8, 36. Okay. And he ordered the chariot to stop and they both went down into the water and Philip as well as the eunuch and he baptized him on the spot basically. Oh, by the way, we think of them as just being alone, but most likely that this eunuch had a caravan of milita military escorts with him. He was bringing something very precious, something that he had something, with, and I'll show you why. So he probably had military escort, and it was a huge caravan being sent by the queen. And he got baptized by Philip. And when they came out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The word snatched there is actually the word uh, harpazo also, the same word as raptured. And uh, Eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. So he was somehow uh, translated like, you know, like, what's the word in Star Trek? What? Yeah, he was uh, what's it called? beamed up or he just, he, he ended up in another location. It was a supernatural, he was snatched away by, by the Holy Spirit. Teleported. Teleported, Okay. Now, I'm going to show you Isaiah, why we think that this eunuch was coming from Ethiopia. What, what I mean, we, we can't be 100% sure, but we believe that he was fulfilling a prophecy in Isaiah 18. And I don't, I can't spend much time because this will open up one, another one hour of discussion. In, uh, in, this is referring to Ethiopia. Alas, Acts chapter 18, verse 1. Alas, oh, this is talking about at the second coming of Christ, at the establishment of his millennial reign, of his millennial rule, his kingdom on the earth, at the second coming. Alas, O oh, land of whirring wings. So mosquitoes is the translation in other, in other uh, which is correct, whirring wings, mosquitoes. Oh, land of whirring wing, wings, which lies beyond the rivers of Kush. This is the Nile River, and sure enough, Ethiopia is at the end of the Nile, at the rivers of Kush. It's talking about Ethiopia which sends envoys by the sea, even in papyrus vessels on the surface of the waters. Go, swift messengers, to a nation tall and smooth. So the people of Ethiopia were very tall, very smooth skin. To a people fear, fa feared far and wide, a powerful and oppressive nation whose land the rivers divide. So they were known to be great warriors to the point that they were the, they were the rivals of Egypt before Egypt finally conquered them. According to Josephus, it was Moses who won them uh, conquered and, and annexed them. And you see that in the, the movie Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston when they pay homage. But that's Hollywood and that's Josephus. But back then they were quite a power and they were a threat to uh, Egypt. But they became a divided uh, United Kingdom to the point that um, Pharaoh Necho of Kings, Chronicles and Kings, whom Josiah uh, would encounter, he was Ethiopian according to the history books. And uh, his capital was actually in Elef Elephantine Island, which is in, in um, Ethiopia. He was an Egyptian pharaoh, but his capital was in Elephantine I Island, Ethiopia. So many believe, some scholars believe that when Jesus escaped and ex exiled to Egypt, it was that part of Egypt, uh, Elephantine Island. They have uh, legends, in their, their Bibles there the Ethiopian Orthodox Church have uh, pictures of Jesus visiting them and getting uh, uh, living there. So we don't know if it's true, this tradition for them. But there's reason to believe that when he, out of Egypt, I called my son, he escaped to Egypt. The, that portion of Egypt might have been this area called um, Ethiopia, not necessarily the Egypt as we know today. So uh, all you inhabitants of the world and dwellers on earth, so it's talking about Ethiopia, so he's talking about Ethiopia. Let me just move forward. Okay. Uh, so it's describing the land of Ethiopia. Um, at that time, I, I just jump a few verses ahead. At that time, a gift of homage, something, a gift will be brought to the Lord of hosts from a people, tall and smooth. I like to say that Ethiopians are legendary for being tall and smooth skinned, beautiful skinned, actually. I used to have friends in Kenya who always wanted to meet uh, Ethiopian girls and they I understood that they were considered the most beautiful 
people in in Africa. And I think the Miss Miss Israel was uh, Miss Israel was uh, Ethiopian Jew, right? They were tall and they were smooth skinned. That they were known for that, even from a people feared far away, a powerful and oppressed nation, oppressive nation, whose land the rivers divide to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, even Mount Zion. Okay, so a gift of homage. So that's it, and um, I just want to mention that that it seems that they were that Queen Candice the time and the Ethiopian eunuch were trying to fulfill a prophecy in Isaiah 18. But when they came to Jerusalem, instead of finding the Messiah ruling from Jerusalem, instead they found out that he was crucified and he probably brought back the gospel. This is probably the start of the, the, uh, the Ethiopian church with this eunuch after Philip shared the gospel and that probably told the queen, yes, it was him, the right guy, but we came too soon, 2,000 years too soon. So possibly when Jesus returns, another eunuch will be bringing this uh, thing. Now, just to keep, keep it short, um, many believe that this is the mercy seat, which is a, the lid that covers the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is um, uh, wood that would have deteriorated, but the mercy seat is made of hammered wood. And some speculate that it is shaped with the cherubim wings touch each other. The other wings might have formed the armrest because they've seen Egyptian, similar Egyptian design where the wings are touching and then the rest is forms the armchair because the mercy seat is always regarded as a separate object all throughout the Old Testament from the Ark of the Covenant being that wooden box where the Ten Commandments and Aaron's rod uh, and uh, the manna was, right? But the mercy seat would be this seat separate object that is sitting on top. It is used in Yom Kippur when they sprinkle the blood, not only on the seat, they call it the mercy seat, that lid, but also before it. And we learn in some other passages in uh, that um, Jesus, when he, well, anyway, I, let me just skip to that. So, so I believe, and many scholars believe that this may be actually the throne of Jesus in the millennium. It may be the throne, his throne, the, the, the seat, because we know that it will not, the Ark of the Covenant will no longer be um, important in the millennium. But very often, but Jesus, God will tell Moses, meet me between the cherubim. You know, I'll meet you between the cherubim. It's talking about the mercy seat. It's like a place of the meeting inside the tabernacle at the mercy seat. It's as if it's a pattern of what will happen one day when... Um, so I don't want to get in that because we could spend, I have a lot of scripture to share with that. Maybe we can make that a separate session. So that's possibly what this, um, this eunuch is bringing. Possibly they may have access. And how did the, the, the Ark of the Covenant reach there? Well, since they had prophecies from Moses that Israel would be overrun by bad kings and even by their enemies, it's possible that Solomon and David had already made provision for the Levites to, to escape. They were had an alliance with Egypt uh, at that time, Neko. And, and uh, we understand that when Josiah, after Manasseh totally you know, eliminated the, you know, the, the, the practice of Judaism, his son, an eight-year-old king named uh, Josiah, uh, brought it back and he discovered the, covered the Torah. And they were really, you know, and he was saying, bring back the ark of the covenant you Levite so that it will no longer rest on your shoulders. He said that, when it, he said that in uh, 2 Chronicles 35 verse 3. In, it's implying that they've been carrying that ark all along. It's not sitting where it should be in the temple. They've been carrying. So bring it back in the temple under Josiah and so that you'll no longer be a burden to the shoulders because they're not supposed to put it anywhere except the temple. And if they are going to transport it, they have to do it. Only the Levites could carry it on poles. And we know what happened during the time of uh, David when it ended up in the Philistines. Someone touched that and people died. It was not something you could just casually carry it away. There were specifications. They had to be Levites and they had to use poles. No one had to touch it. So they were burdened by it. And Josiah is saying, now that we've restored the temple worship, we've discovered the Torah after years of uh, apostasy because of King Manasseh, his father. He said, return the ark and so that it'll no longer be a, a, a burden. So where was the ark all this time? So many, some said it was in hiding. 
uh, with Egypt under Neko for safekeeping. And it doesn't say in the Chronicles that they returned it. In fact, later on, we see that Josiah would encounter Neko. And we don't know why, because they're supposed to be allies, because supposed to be the, fr your, the, the friend of your enemy should be my friend. The enemy of my friend, sorry, the, the, what's the term? Yeah, the friend of my enemy is my friend, right? Okay, so uh, the uh, Neko, Egypt, is going up against Assyria. Uh, instead of like helping him, he goes against him, Josiah, and Neko tells him, you know, what are you doing? I have no war with you. I have no house. I don't have any war with your house, uh, Josiah. Why are you coming against me? So uh, he gets, he dies from an arrow, uh, an archer sh shoots him and he dies, Josiah. It seems like he was trying to get something back from Neko because the Levites, they might have, there is a presence in Ethiopia and, and they, the, the Levitical Jews called the Palasha. And they were there until the 1990s. And they uh, had tradition of the oldest surviving mosaic rituals. Because today's uh, Judaism in Israel is nothing like the Bible. We find that in Ethiopia. So I thought I'd just share that and to explain what he might be bringing with him and why he is a believer in the Messiah. And uh, so he, came, he possibly told Queen Candice that, yeah, it's him, but not yet. Maybe in the future and the second coming. So let's finish the book of Acts. We're almost done. Acts chapter 8. Okay, so he got baptized. And we end up here where Philip leaves him. The Holy Spirit would snatch him the word snatch there is harpazo. So it's the same word for rapture. He is caught up by the Holy Spirit. But Philip found himself at Azotus. And as he passed through, the, passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. I mentioned that the Ark of Covenant could be in Ethiopia. But that's one of many views. I just share that because uh, we touched on the Ethiopian eunuch. Someone asked me last time, is, asked me, is Sheba Ethiopia? Yes and no, there is two Shebas that I know of, prominent one. One which is Ethiopia, but in relation to Ophir, I believe that the other Sheba is the brother of Ophir. And Psalm 72 tells us that Sheba are the Isles. And Sheba, the Queen Sheba, returns after uh, King Hiram and Solomon's uh, sailors uh, go to Ophir to retrieve gold and wood. And on the way back, they bring the Queen of Sheba. So they were possibly neighbors. So that is another Sheba no fear, which I believe is the Philippines, not Ethiopia. So uh, I think it was uh, Myla who asked that. It's not here today. No? Myla is the one who asked that. So yes, there's a Sheba Ethiopia, but I don't think she's a Sheba of who visited King David during the time when they were fetching gold from Ophir. That Sheba, I believe, is the same as the Sheba the region of uh, Philippines, along with, along with Ophir, and they brought back from three and a half years far away, only resources that are available in the Philippines, nowhere, nowhere else. Some other countries may have gold, but not all the resources. Only Philippines fits the description, and it's a three and a half journey. So it's another discussion for another time, but I thought I'd just mention that. Okay, so we're done. And um, I'm gonna open now the floor to sharing or for those who may have questions. Okay, so are you all muted? Anyone can ask now a question or share their thoughts. <coughs> Do you guys have any, any questions to ask? So I, I, any questions you guys have? Okay, so I think you can all unmute now. Anyone who wants to, to take the mic, feel free. We still we, we have about 30 minutes to to discuss. As we go along in the next chapters, I'm gonna show you how in as we go along, you may see baptism or baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's like you won't all see four. You'll see four under Hebrews chapter six, where Paul says these are the found, these are the foundations. Um, Paul is the most complete, but 
the reason for that is because the book of Acts is one book. It's not meant to be like read a verse and make a doctrine out of one verse. It has to be seen as a whole. So when you go through the whole of it, you're going to see all four responses to the gospel are there. Believing, repenting, believing, uh, baptism in water, and baptism of the Holy Spirit through the laying of hands. I actually have a question. I actually have a question. Please go ahead. Um, you know the Ark of the Covenant? I forgot in which book I was reading, but it was talking about uh, that whenever, you know, when the Ark was in enemy territory, that tumors broke out on people. So where, where, because there's, a, there are a lot of questions about where the Ark is. So is there, are there any theories about, because I think Ethiopia or some, I think Ethiopia had a, had a claimed that it was with them. They certainly do with regard to the, uh, those uh, tumors. That was during the time of David and uh, where the Philistines got, got hold of the, uh, the ark. And um, was it the time of David? Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was David. Yeah, um, they, it fell into the hands of the Philistines and the Philistines, um, they kind of, it, they disrespected it. Yeah, and then people began to get tumors and so they sent it back and they also made they, they made golden tumors to as a way of respecting the art you know and what happened was that uh, uh it ended up uh, not from jerusalem but it was kept for a period of time in a place not in, uh, i forget the name of the place i don't remember it in a while and to the point that uh, some people even touched it and dropped dead literally right so that was the time of king david they thought that the ark was like their idols, the uh, Philistines, that uh, the way they used it were idols. They bring it to war and use it as a weapon. And so, so there, you, you know the exact verse? I think it's in uh, Second Samuel. If you can find those, two, it's two more. Now, the second part of your question, uh, Nelia. Okay, so the, the ark was always, was always in the temple. So first the tabernacle, then the temple. So uh, David built and Solomon built uh, Solomon built the temple, and that's where it stays in the holy of holies. Of uh, that's where it was kept. But you know, Israel had well Judah actually southern kingdom. Israel was northern part Samaria. Judah had good kings and bad kings. Among the bad kings were Manasseh, and 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 Moses did prophesy you're going to have evil kings, and one of them who was really bad was. Hezekiah, Hezekiah was a good king, but the son of Hezekiah was Manasseh, and he 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 strove to exterminate Judaism, Mosaic Judaism, to the point that they were worshiping, uh, you know, the, their enemies' gods, right? So whenever that happened, the Levites, given that history and given the prophecies of Moses, they they already had contingency contingency plans. So most likely, when the bad kings ruled, they snuck, they hid the ark from being destroyed or right and um, when Josiah his eight-year-old king took over they just they rediscovered the Torah that's the point where they brought back the worship the, on the of Passover they had the sacrifices again because Manasseh ruled for a long time the father of Josiah and he brought it back so you know there were times when uh, they just Totally, it was just totally exterminated from the land. When I say exterminated, it was totally removed because of these evil kings. So the Levites, what they probably did is they would hide, go into hiding and also hide the ark for safekeeping, given that history. Now, around in Chronicles is the last mention of the ark, and after that, it just disappears, totally never to be mentioned again. And we know around that time is when Manasseh was the king, the evil king. And it's last mentioned by Isaiah. It says, bring back the ark. He's saying, put it back in the temple after they discovered the Torah and they begin the worship again, the, the sacrifices. He's saying, bring it back. It implies it was not there. So that you're, it will not, let's read that. Let's go to, I, let me read that. Second Chronicles chapter 35. Yeah. This is the time of Josiah. He's about eight years old, an eight-year-old king. Can you imagine an eight-year-old king, guys? 
Isaiah chapter 35. So he has restored the worship of Yahuwah. Sorry, I was talking about 2 Chronicles 35. So this is Josiah. And he's brought back the temple sacrifices. He set the priests in their offices and encouraged them in the service of the house of the Lord. So picture this. Decades, there is no temple sacrifices. The Levites had to go to hiding because of Manasseh, a very evil king. And his son takes over and becomes a follower of God, of Yahuwah. He also said to the Levites who taught all Israel and who were holy to the Lord, put the holy ark in the house which Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, built. He's saying, put it, put it there. It's, the fact that he's saying, put it there, means to say it's not there. Because that's where it should rest, in the Holy of Holies. He says, put it there. So the, by implication, it hasn't been there because of Manasseh's reign, where he, they worship the, uh, the gods, the pagan gods. And he says here, it will be, he's saying, it will be a burden on your shoulders no longer. It's, so in other words, it's currently a burden on their shoulders. It means to say, that they are moving around with it on their shoulders. Every time they took it out of the temple for transport, it had to be on these golden poles. No human was supposed to touch it. So he said, so it will no longer be a burden on your, on your shoulders. Now serve the Lord your God and his people. So he said, put it back so no longer have to carry it. That's what he's saying. So they've been carrying it. The question is, where were they carrying it? So it's been out of Jerusalem for safekeeping. You can imply from here. Now, it doesn't say here that the Levites returned it. It's just no, nothing, right? Remember, prior to this, the good kings made alliances with Egypt, uh, like Deco was one of them. And we know that uh, possibly that they made uh, provision to hide the ark in the event that evil kings or their enemies like Babylon or Assyria would overrun Israel. So it doesn't say that the Levites returned it, but if you go to the end of this, uh, so they're celebrating the Passover. Obviously, they're celebrating the Passover without, without the Ark. Normally, they would sprinkle at Yom Kippur also the uh, Passover, the, the blood on the mercy seat, which is the lid covering the Ark, right? So they might have done it without that. Uh, I jumped a few verses I had to 20. It says, after all this, when they restored all the, the sacrifices, the feasts, after all this, when Josiah had set the temple in order, so there's no mention of the return of the ark. Neko, king of Egypt, he's an, an Ethiopian. He's Pharaoh in what was once Egypt and Ethiopia as an empire. He, he came up to make war at Karshemish on the Euphrates. And jo Josiah went out to engage him. So they should be allies because you know, Israel, by this time, um, the northern kingdom had been uh, ravaged and attacked by, the, by Assyria, and, and they knew they were next on the, on, on, the, on, the, on the list. And Neko is out to encounter the Assyrians, and you think that Josiah should help Neko, but instead he meant to, he meant to engage him. Why would he do that? But Neko sent messengers to him saying, what have we to do with each other, O King of God? Said, what is our fight, basically? Why are you going up? I'm not coming against you today, but against the house with which I am at war. That's Assyria. And God has ordered me to hurry. So he's saying God is, he, he's saying as if God has ordered him, the God of Israel. And he, so it's possible he had Levites living in his side also, giving him instructions. Stop for your own sake from interfering with, with God who is with me. He's saying that God is with me. So that he will not destroy you. So we can only presume that he was also hearing from God, possibly through the Levites, who had, who had now begun to live in uh, or to 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 our exile and ref refuge in in Egypt, Ethiopia, under his care, and uh, he's on his way to to go do battle with uh, with Assyrians. However, Josiah would not turn away from him. But he's a good king. He's one of the good kings. And I always went and wondered, why did he die? Because all the good kings are all, never die. They're always victorious, like David. But Josiah would not turn away from him, but disguised himself in order to make war with him. So he wants something from him. 
nor did he listen to the words of Necho from the mouth of God. So the, the writer of, the, of this Second Chronicles, possibly Samuel, saying it's from the mouth of God, but came to make war on the plain of Megiddo. He's a good king. The archer shot King Josiah, and the king said to his servants, take me away, for I am badly wounded. So his servants took him out of the chariot, carried him in the second chariot which he had, and brought him to Jerusalem where he died and was buried in the tombs of his father. So this is a good king. He's the only good king I know who was you know, defeated. So he was going against the will of God, obviously. And we can only speculate that um, Necho was being advised possibly by the Levites who were in exile and who had the ark in Ethiopia. And there are now traditions that it is now, it, it was there in Elephantine Island, which is the capital of, uh, of Ethiopia at the time and, and the headquarters and capital of Pharaoh Necho. And for eight centuries, it stayed there until it moved down to what is now known as uh, um, Lake Kana, Tur 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 Kana, I don't know the exact name. Tana, Lake Tana. And if you go there, there are these buildings that are meant to house the Ark of the Covenant. But would you believe that when they have 10 or 20,000 of them, all of them claim to have the Ark of the Covenant. So obviously they're uh, they believe that one of them has it, and the, the, the reason why they have tens of thousands is to be a decoy, so that you'll, ne you'll never know which one is the real thing. Remember, this is just one view. Others believe that it's buried underneath the Temple Mount. Some believe it was buried under the actual uh, uh, crucifixion site of Jesus, which they discovered a few years ago. It's not. They discovered it in the... Um, by Bob Cornuke and some of the, uh, they discovered where the real temple site is. It's in the city of David. It's not on the Temple Mount where the Dome of the Rock is. And they discovered the, the actual crucifixion site across for, from it where from the, the city of David, they could see the crucifixion. So I hope that answers in a very short time. Nelia, I, um, we could really talk about that more, uh, but um, I could share you also some videos on this that I think would really help you. Now, do I believe that it's in Ethiopia. I'm open-minded about it. It's possible. Maybe just the, just the mercy seat. Maybe not necessarily the, the art box, the box itself. Um, they're prob prob probably together. But I, I lean on, on the view that the mercy seat, that the lid that's going to be the, the covering of this ark is also going to be the throne of Jesus Christ in the millennium. So he said, uh, all throughout, you know, I will meet you in between the cherubim, which is the mercy seat. And there are verses in, like in Ezekiel, where the place of my throne and the soles of my feet, they would sprinkle, that will be his throne. In, uh, in other passages, they would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat and also just before it, which sounds like the seat and where his souls will be. So right now, I can't be 100%. I just lean on the view. I can't say anything more than that. So possibly it'll be his throne because it, since it's hammer good, it would have survived all this millennia. But the, the box itself, maybe not. Okay, anyone else want to share their thoughts or ask a question? Anyone can answer, anyone can share their thoughts. You guys, you have any questions or thoughts to share? Yeah, what did you learn? The what impacted you the most? Uh, was there something here that, like you know, that caught your attention and you think it's worth studying some more? How would you apply it? The yeah, the baptism. Okay, what about it? He jumped off immediately. But why was he going to be baptized when right now? Yeah, look, there is water. What's to stop me from yeah. being baptized? And what's removed in the modern translation is verse 37. If you believe, what does it say? In Acts, check your Bibles. Acts 8.37 has been removed or been relegated to a footnote uh, that says it's not in earlier translations. If you believe, so if you believe with all your heart, you may. So the condition to getting baptized is if you believe. Peter, repent. So repentance and believing are the conditions to being baptized. If one is missing, I don't think you're going to have a, you're not going to have a biblical baptism. 
because you got to have both. You got to repent. Without repenting, there's nothing to burden. Without believing, why are you getting baptized? It's a silly thing to do, right? And if someone from the West or someone that tells you, you know, baptism is not really in water. It's, it's just spiritual baptism. Show them ch chapter 8, verse 36. They look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? So it's definitely water. Water baptism. Okay, what else? Anyone else wants to share their thoughts? Or ask a question? I think the, the mercy talks about it's, it's prophetic about a physical kingdom. Okay, so Bar Barbie says that she thinks that the mercy seat uh, <clears throat> is a prophetic of a coming kingdom on the earth. You know, that Jesus will not only establish kingdom, uh, it will be not only spiritual, it will be a physical, literal. Your kingdom, may your kingdom come and may will be, will be done on earth. And it will be on the earth for a thousand years at his second coming. So thank you, Barb's. How come the Ethiopians know about it? Okay, so Barbie's asking, how come the, the Ethiopians knew about the Messiah? Okay, so one, either they were proselytes, they were Ethiopians, or two, they were Jewish, they were believing Ethiopians. Yeah, okay, definitely they were Ethiopians, but believing Ethiopians. So if they were not proselytes, he could have been a Jew, a Levite, a Falasha Jew, meaning to say, Possibly among those who moved down there during the time of the evil kings to keep to, to safeguard it. And they set up a uh, refuge, right? And so they maintain, or they were Ethiopians who came to faith. Because remember, we learned from Solomon that the, a lot of the nations believe in Messiah. Uh, not Messiah, but in, in the God of David. They, they paid homage to David as far as Sheba, who came from a very far away land. And we know it's not Ethiopia because. If you read the passage in uh, 2 Kings 9, she brought materials that were never, ever seen. From, uh, ever seen. Well, Ethiopia and Egypt are just next door to Israel. So that's not possible because they're just like, you know, when Abraham uh, went down to Egypt, just like next door. You know, so very often there's a lot of interactions between Egypt and, that, and, and Jerusalem. But this Sheba... She, she came from a foreign land and the, the reputation is only half they heard. Not something you would expect of someone who lived next door to Ethiopia and, and Egypt. This was a Sheba that was far away. This Sheba was the Sheba, brother of fear, the lands of the island, the isles, according to Psalm 72, the Philippines. Okay, so we still have time. If you guys want to share your thoughts and ask, please do now. We, have, we still have time. And I'm going to end the recording also now.